Hello, 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 and welcome to Nursing News You Can Use at Five with Baxter Professional Services and the Nurse Shark Academy. I want to say thank you for joining us. I'm so excited to be here today. Uh, today has been a phenomenal day, and I'll be telling you all about the great stuff that's happening and the great things and offers that we have for you. But let's first get into our affirmations for today. So today is March the 15th, 2023, and our first affirmation is strive for progress, not perfection. Strive for progress, not perfection. Our next affirmation, surround yourself with who you want to be. Surround yourself with who you want to be. And lastly, if you're making mistakes, it means you're trying. If you're making mistakes, at least you're trying, or it means you're trying. And that all comes from our inspirational daily calendar, giving your affirmations for today. All right, let's get into our leadership moment. Got excited about this. Now, let me let you tell let me tell you i attended a three-day conference on kingdom entrepreneurship with 100x pedro dale you've heard me talk about him before but i want to say one of their speakers michael dalton really spoke to me at this conference and so i just thought for our leadership moment i'll just share a little bit of highlights how about that So one of the things he says is that favor can take you, that meaning the the favor of God, can take you where men cannot take you. Favor is permission to rule. The favor of God is setting you in a position to rule whatever you lost going through life, you have enough left to rule. What you do with your favor, it determines how far you moved into your destiny. God gives everybody the chance to believe. Tell God yes. The battle is about your yes. I can tell tell him yes if I don't think that he, meaning God, will fight for me. And then he goes on and talks about this. And this is what really stuck with me. He says, God declares what is was in him so he can expand who he is. You have to open your mouth and say what you are seeing. Life steals your words. Every trauma attack makes you feel quiet. And I thought about that, that oftentimes when we're feeling attacked, what, and especially my response, my response to that is I, I, I'm going to um, go away, be quiet, go in a corner, hide, whatever it is. But I tend to disengage. And he talked about how life steals your words and how it makes us quiet. And I see that with my clients and my patients, um, how they don't express themselves and don't talk. And he says, loss makes you stop talking. Trauma steals your dreams. In your quietness, you lose expansion. Whatever you talk about is what you have. Some of us pay stupid people to hang out with us because you don't believe who you can be without them. And that goes back to our affirmation, which is surround yourself with, you know, who you want to be. He says, you have to be willing to begin without information. God invites you to participate. You have to participate in the act of faith because expansion comes out of the spirit and then manifestation um, into the natural. And so that's some of the information that was given. And I loved it, loved it, loved it. It was a great conference. There's so much. I've got about 20 pages of notes. Um, you can see from my notebook. And I have a friend who was kind enough. He typed a lot of his notes, but mine are just handwritten notes <laughs> in my notebook. Um, but it was an awesome conference. And so I'm very pleased to have participated. So let's go on into our news segment because there's a lot to cover. And then we have some great announcements, and I want to get to the great announcements. So our very first story is coming out of uh, McKnight's Long-Term Care News, and it talks about artificial intelligence leading to more nursing home coverage denials. 
I wanted to start with this story because um, I just had a conversation this morning uh, with someone who is a, a, a patient advocate and she helps people negotiate their um, hospital bills and payments. So if anybody's looking for someone like that, I've got the gal for you. Um, and she's actually adding to that more, more to her business. She's been doing that. She's working with attorneys doing those things. Um, sounds like phenomenal um, gifting that she has to sit through and sift through all those uh, insurance regulations. So she knows her game. She knows her stuff about insurance. So if she's the one you want to talk to, let me know, comment, send me a message. We'll, I'll get you hooked up with her. Anyway, so artificial intelligence leading to more nursing home coverage denials. And we've been talking about the use of the chat G. G TP or whatever it's called, and all this artificial intelligence. And I've not gotten on board with that. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, if you see stuff written right now, it's me writing it. So if it's got any typos or grammatical errors in there, it's me. It's my fault. I, you know, typed on the, on the you know, really fast. So um, I'm not, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I think we have to have questions about the appropriate use of this technology. So let's get into the story. And it says an investigation published by Stat News Monday accused insurers of using, quote, unregulated predictive algorithm algorithms under the guise of scientific rigor to pinpoint the precise moment when they can plausibly cut off payment of an older patient's treatment. The report was based on a court documents and extensive interviews comes from the federal government, um, tries to reduce the number of pre-authorization and other denials to address a spate of consumer complaints. It also follows a February study from the Journal of Applied Gerontology that showed ageism has been designed into some AI tools. And I just want to say, uh, during the conference, Pedro, I, 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 not, mentioned that ageism has has more effect um, than we realize um, in the marketplace. And so this is this is ringing some bells with me because now we have I mean, these are things that we've known, but now we're seeing where some of this AI has bias already built into it. And so this is where those issues are coming. It says uh, the increasing use of artificial intelligence to guide decision making in healthcare may further fuel government regulators' attempts to rein in MA plans. Stat outlined the cases of two nursing home residents whose skilled nursing, uh, whose skilled care coverage was denied after an AI tool recommended that they should be better by a certain number of days. Now, I'm sorry, we're not robots. Everybody's different. Some people may take longer to heal than others. And it says uh, both had their payment cut off at a time corresponding with an algorithm cut point, despite physician's orders and documentation indicated that they needed ongoing skilled care. While the article focused on the impact on post-acute patients going to nursing homes, AI is also keeping patients out of other settings, including rehab hospitals. In response, one insurer told Stat that its AI tool is meant to be used as a guide to inform providers about the care patients may need rather than a directive to discharge, but patient advocates objected to that characterization. According to David Lipschutz, Associate Director of the Center for Medicare Advocacy, he says, while the firms say the algorithm is suggestive, it ends up being a hard and fast rule that the plan or the care management firms really try to follow. So again, I can imagine how this could happen. You put the data into the algorithm and the algorithm says, hey, they should be better in going home. And you have a certain productivity that you have to meet as the, the person making these decisions. And if you override that too many times, then it may negatively affect you and your employment. I could see how this could possibly come out. I'm not saying that that's how it works. I'm just saying I can see how that's plausible. And he goes on to say, there's no deviation from it, no accounting for changes in condition, no accounting for situations in which a person could use more care. 
consumer groups and academics have previously warned that insurers' use of artificial intelligence could further impede the relationship between patients and their healthcare providers. And as a healthcare provider, I'm like, ding, 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 yes. While the goal is to serve patients in the lowest security setting, and possibly make healthcare more efficient, it's unclear whether or how much early discharges might influence rehospitalization or mortality rates. And I just spoke with this um, woman uh, this morning who said that she had a client that the facility in which she was staying did not want to further fill out her information so she can continue her her medicare days for her rehab they wanted her to switch to traditional medicare and some other things but she didn't meet the criteria for that according to this person and then she had a much better plan for her situation but they never wanted to appeal with the plan and so the patient was set up to she had to do the appeal and didn't do it so then she ended up being out of the out of the uh a nursing home um prematurely, supposedly. So these are things that are happening. So this is a real life example of seeing some of this. And I'm not saying it was because of some AI tool, but it makes me wonder if that might have played a part in the insurance company saying, nope, you got to go. I don't know. Um, so that's more information to please check out the article in McKnight's long-term news and kind of go further. And if you have any insights into this and you know more about this, let me know, because I'm very curious to see what's going to happen um, going forward. Uh, so let's move on to this next story. Uh, this is about, I got this out of Lawyers Weekly, Michigan Lawyers Weekly. And the reason why I got it is because this is something that um, I face in a medical practice is a request for emotional support animals and things like that. But this seems to be a service dog. And so this happens to be a, an issue with a student nurse who had a service dog and the hospital initially allowed them to bring the dog in, but because one patient had an allergic reaction and there was a complaint, then there, she was not allowed to bring her service dog in. And so this brings up those questions of nursing education, nursing care, and how can we accommodate people with disabilities? So I wanted to talk about this because I thought this was interesting. Um, and it says, a uh, court upholds denial of student nurses service dog. A hospital did not violate the Americans with Disabilities Act by withdrawing its accommodation of allowing a service dog to accompany a student nurse intern on her rounds, according to a ruling from the Eastern District of Michigan, granting the defendant's motion for summary judgment. Hurley Medical Center had granted Mia Bennett's request for accommodations to bring her service dog, Pistol, with her on clinical, her clinical nursing rotation, but it withdrew it after a patient and staff member had severe allergic reactions. Uh, according to uh, U.S. District Court Judge Paul D. Borman, no reasonable jury could dispute that Hurley did conduct an individualized assessment and reasonably concluded that Pistol, who would have accompanied Bennett to every patient on her rounds with doctors and nurses, was a direct threat to the health and safety of all the patients and staff on 7E and 9E. The opinion, opinion is Bennett versus Hurley Medical Center. So if you want to look that up and, and really delve into it, you can. Uh, Grand Blanc attorney Michael W. Edmonds of Galt De Devison, who represented the hospital, said the court reached the correct decision after considering the rights of the various parties. Um, Ni Nicholas Ro Romel uh, of Noct Law in Ann Arbor, who represented the student nurse intern, didn't respond to a request for comment for this article by the deadline. And so according to the attorney, it says, uh, for the hospital, the hospital has to balance the rights of disabled people with the rights of its patients and can't sacrifice patient care. The hospital is an anti-dog. In fact, it started out accommodating the plaintiff, but a bunch of people had allergic reactions. Well, a bunch, couple. Yeah, I think he's exaggerating a little bit. It sounds like it was a couple, according to the article. But anyway, this is where it becomes interesting. 
In 2017, Mia Bennett, a nursing student at the University of Michigan, Flint, was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder with a history of panic attacks. Bennett contends that Pistol, her Pembroke Welsh Corky, Corgi dog, helps to minimize the attacks. She primarily trained the dog herself to detect a rise in her anxious behaviors and signal her to take medication to stop a panic attack. As a UM Flint nursing student, Bennett was required to complete clinical training rotations that complement her coursework at nearby hospitals each semester. She was to begin at Hurley Medical Center in the fall of 2020, following doctors and nurses making rounds of patients' uh, rooms for four hours a week on Wednesdays for six weeks. Bennett was scheduled to intern on floor 7E when a patient conditions include infectious disease, congestive heart failure, vascular and post-surgical patients, and the designated unit for renal patients, many of whom are in, immunocompromised, as well as 9E, which has an oncology unit. Two weeks before rotation, Bennett emailed Hurley's Human Resources Department to apply for accommodation that would allow her to bring pistol on her rotation. The request was approved with a note on the use of pistol needed to comply with Hurley's standard practices. The first day Bennett brought Pistol to start a rotation, a nurse with severe dog allergies had to be sent home and missed an additional day of work after having a reaction requiring the entire nursing staff on the floor to be reshuffled. A patient also had an allergic reaction to Pistol without the dog even entering his room. Hurley then reevaluated Bennett's accommodation. The hospital considered putting Pistol in a lycra body suit to minimize allergic reactions or crating the dog during patient care time frames with the opportunity for Bennett to take necessary breaks as needed. Bennett ultimately finished her rotation at Hurley without Pistol and without suffering any panic attacks. She then sued the hospital, asserting claims of the Americans with Disabilities Act um, and the Michigan's Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act. Hurley moved for summary judgment. Bennett alleged that Hurley intentionally discriminated against her and denied her a reasonable accommodation in violation of the ADA. Borman disagreed. Bennett abandoned her claim of intentional discrimination under the ADA, the judge said, and summary judgment was appropriate on the reasonable accommodation claim because Pistol was a direct threat to health and safety. So this is where those things come out. And I want to say, and I am not faulting this, this student nurse, don't get me wrong. I understand people have anxiety and they do have emotional support animals. I do not think that this was a service animal because a service animal is properly trained, has a service animal vest, um, and they're trained by a professional. This is an emotional support animal, and even they should be trained, but this animal uh, sounds like was not. I'm not saying the animal was out of control or any of those things happened, but I think that her argument was a little weak on that uh, because it, I know that there's a difference between service animals and emotional support animals from the primary care uh, standpoint when you're signing those forms. Um, So, yeah. So there's a lot of things that happen, but she finished her. To me, I'm like, yeah, they, they didn't accommodate you, but guess what? You finished your rotation. You got through it. Um, so we'll see what happens. But just to following those those types of cases, because we had the the story of the um, the nurse that uh, was psychiatrically committed because they thought that he was under the influence when he had a medical condition. Yeah. So these are things that are becoming up more and more. So I just want to put us on our radar. All right. So let's go on to this story. Um, I'm going to move on to this one. This one is about a nursing home administrator. This is a bizarre story. And so I kind of wanted to put this out there because we're going to be seeing more and more stories coming out because of COVID. And this was a really bizarre story. So it says, fired nursing home administrator asked employees to test positive for COVID. This is coming from midhudsonnews.com. I, I just found this kind of bizarre. So according to the story, uh, Bert Kahn, the former administrator of the Sullivan County Adult Care Center, 
was fired in October 2021 after being charged with incompetence and misconduct by the county. Charges included Khan asking employees of the nursing home to volunteer to test positive for COVID. After his termination, Khan filed an appeal with the Supreme Court Appellate Division for the Third Judicial Department to get his job back. The court recently decided to uphold the termination for actions Khan took during the height of the COVID pandemic. So this is what they're saying that happened, and this is why I find this kind of strange. So it says, in at least three instances between March 2021 and May of 2021, Khan asked staff members to volunteer to test positive for COVID-19 in order to reduce the visitation at the facility by family and friends of patients. During the hearing, he admitted doing so in order to protect the clients and staff. The former administrator testified that he stopped asking the question when a staff member said the question made her uncomfortable. Addressing the actions of Khan, the court said, quote, petitioner's testimony that he asked this question as a joke to lighten the load uh, evinces remarkably poor judgment and a flippant disregard of the potential seriousness of contracted COVID-19, all the more so in a nursing home environment. The other uh, char original charges also included misconduct where so he allegedly suggested to certain ACC employee that she share her login information with another employee for the purposes of entering required data into the Center for Disease Control, CDC, portal for COVID data. The CDC has strict guidelines against having unauthorized people gain access to the database and violators are subject to fines and penalties. The county's code of conduct was violated when Khan, Khan, when he knowingly suggested that employees share credentials with a co-worker, Khan himself did not have access to the system, and when given the opportunity to be the only second employee of ACC to get authorization, he neglected to file for his credentials. So then the other thing that they ruled, it says, when considering um, petitioner's position as the administrator of a nursing home during the COVID-19 pandemic, which required the highest degree of integrity, diligence, and competence in light of the vulnerability of ACC clients and staff, we cannot conclude that the penalty of termination is so disproportionate to the charged offenses as to shock one's sense of fairness. So again, that was just a really bizarre story, and I'm like, why would you even ask people to do that? But I just had to bring that up because it was really strange. Okay. Here is another story um, that I found a bit disturbing. And I know that these things go on and happen. This is from ABC News. Um, and it says, in nursing homes, impoverished live final days on pennies. And I, and I wanted to... Uh, bring because we've kind of talked about some of these things in the past about how nursing homes are funded, how people are paid, etc. But I wanted to show this picture because this is another piece of the picture when it focuses on the residents and it may explain why we have the issues that we have. So let's go on. Um, new pants to replace Alex. Uh, Morrissey's tattered khakis will have to wait. There's no cash left for sugar cookies either. Even at the month's start, the budget is so bare that fixident is a luxury. Now, halfway through it, things are so tight that even a Diet Pepsi is a stretch. So 82-year-old Morrissey says, how many years do I have left? He lives in a Philadelphia nursing home. I want to live those as well as I can, but to some degree, you lose your dignity. Across the U.S., hundreds of thousands of nursing home residents are locked in a wretched bind, driven into poverty, forced to hand over all income, and to live on a stipend as low as $30 a month. In, long -term, in the long-term care system that subjects some of society's frailest to daily indignities, Medicare's person, Medicaid's personal needs allowance, as the stipend is called, is among the most ubiquitous yet least known. 
Nearly two thirds of American nursing home residents have their care paid for by Medicaid. And in exchange, all social security, pension and other income they would have received is instead rerouted to go toward their bill. The personal needs allowance is meant to pay for anything not provided by the home from a phone to clothes and shoes to a birthday present for a grandchild. One problem, Congress hasn't raised the allowance in decades. So this is a big issue. This is beyond just, you know, uh, affecting one person. This is affecting every, everyone that resides in a nursing home who is on Medicaid in the country. So according to Sam Brooks, who's the attorney for the National Consumer Voice for Quality Long-Term Care, um, says it's really one of the most humiliating things for them. It can really be a point of shame, which is very true. Having uh, worked in long-term care facilities, I can definitely tell you it's really tough when there's an outing and they can't afford to go because they can't buy the meal. They can't participate in the activities. Especially when an individual has no close relatives and no one able to financially help, the alliance can breed striking need. When Marla Carter visits her mother-in-law at a nursing home in Owensboro, K Kentucky, the scene feels more 19th century poorhouse than modern day America. With just a $40 a day a month allowance, residents are dressed in ill-fitting hand-me-downs or hospital gowns that drape open. Some have no socks or shoes. Basic supplies run low. Many don't even have a pen to write with. She, uh, it's reported that she was so horrified that she and her husband started a nonprofit, Faithful Friends Kentucky, to distribute items to area nursing home residents. Among the things most warmly received are Kleenex tissues, because facilities often stock scratchy generics, and even those can be hard to come by. She says, you bring a soda or a toothbrush and they'll get so excited. It's so sad to me. Medicaid was created in 1965 as part of the Great Society programs of Lyndon B. Johnson. A 1972 amendment established a personal needs allowance, set a minimum of $25 monthly. Unlike other benefits like Social Security, cost of living increases were not built into the personal needs allowance rules. So it's only been raised once. In 1987, it was raised to $30 by Congress. Had it been linked to inflation, the article says it would be about $180 today. Can you imagine um, having $180 in long-term care to be able to buy clothes? I mean, you with the $30, you can't even buy one decent bra. You can't buy a really good pair of shoes because oftentimes they need a good pair of shoes. You can't certainly get a full outfit and so these are things that are really important. And some of the politicians have tried, including a representative, Jennifer Wexton, a Democrat from Virginia in 2019, who introduced a bill to raise the minimum allowance to $60. That would be huge for some people, $60. And then also to cement annual increases tied to those for social security it didn't even get a hearing. And so there's more to this story. This is a very long story, uh, very many sad cases, but this is something to keep an eye on. I, I really, I've always said our government needs to do something about this because our seniors can't, can't live. They can't take care of themselves, let alone get a haircut. All right, let's move on because there's a lot going on. So Let's see here. Yeah, let's let's go to let's go to this this story here. This is an editorial, and I'm bringing this up uh, because we've been talking about larger hospitals buying these physicians' practices and then closing them down. We've talked about that in the past. This is an editorial from the Albuquerque Journal. I just happened on this story, but I found this interesting. Um, it says lawmakers have a few more days to save medical clinics. This is something that's happening in this particular state because of a change 
and uh, their malpractice act. So it says distressed doctors worried about having to close their clinics and abandon their patients because of an unattainable malpractice insurance coverage made another call on the state house and senate on Saturday. Um, as a, and as a collective, state lawmakers once again prescribe lip service as time runs out on the 60-day legislative session. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. It happens to us in Indiana, too. They say they're going to do something, and yeah, they don't. At issue is the flawed Medical Malpractice Act of 2021, which in January will recklessly reclassify low-risk outpatient clinics like Southwest Gastroenterology Associates, the New Mexico Cancer Center, I Associates, New Mexico Orthopedic Associates, Women's Specialty of New Mexico, and El Pablo Health Services as large hospitals while raising the clinic's cap on legal damages from 750 thousand to five million that is a huge jump independent physicians and doctors and independently owned outpatient clinics say they can't afford or can't acquire full medical malpractice insurance under the new caps on claims forcing them to close sell their clinics to a corporate hospital or leave the state to continue to practice and so this is uh, something that they've known since 2021, but according to this, they're, you know, the let their state legislators have not taken this up. Um, so I guess the doctors have been pleading with the lawmakers, and on Saturday they had white coat, white shirt, flash mob of 100 physicians and New York Medical Society members clad in white coats and scrubs, uh, take away time for their practice to urge lawmakers to act. In the House, Republicans on Saturday sought to revive House Bill 88, which had been stuck in the House Health and Human Services Committee for a month and moved to either a full chamber for final action or to another committee. But the procedural moves failed. Democrats said it would be inappropriate to bypass the usual committee process, even as Republican Representative Bill Realm of Albuquerque explained, we have a medical crisis. Um, so again, there's also Senate Bill, uh, Senate Bill 296, which uh, would amend the Malpractice Act to limit the recovery for claims against outpatient healthcare facilities that are not majority owned or controlled by a hospital at 750,000 uh, per occurrence, but the bill remains stuck in Senate committees. And now this is what it says. And they said, uh, it's certainly not on behalf of the patients. The proposed reforms don't mean families harmed by medical mistakes won't be compensated. The state has a patient compensation fund, which qualified health care providers pay fees into that covers all or some of large malpractice damage awards. New Mexico already had 700 fewer primary care physicians in 2021 when the malpractice, medical malpractice law was rewritten in 2017. Without malpractice reform, doctors will continue fleeing the state and New Mexicans will have an even harder time finding medical care. So that, that, is, that is the editorial that was published. And so I wanted to bring it out because as we're looking at these reforms, this is why it's important for you to be a part of your state medical or nursing association, because oftentimes they're the ones who are watching out for these bills and hopefully can get these bad bills from being um, uh, voted into law. Okay. So again, there's so much to go through in, in these stories. So I'm going to just try to move on as fast as I can here. Um, this goes back to a uh, similar story that we had talked about several months ago about uh, foreign nurses coming over and being held to these ridiculous contracts and not being able to get out of these contracts. Well, this is kind of the same thing for um, nurses who are in training programs, according to this article. Um, so this is uh, called indentured servitude. Nurses hit with hefty, hefty debt when trying to leave hospitals. Um, and this is coming from uh, NBC News. It says when, oh, Jackie Rum quit her nursing job as Los Robos uh, Regional Medical Center, 
Last fall, over the heavy workload and low staffing levels, it came with a high price, a $2,000 bill from her former employer for training costs. The payment was related to a contract Rum was required to sign when she took the job at the Thousand Oaks California Hospital owned by HCA Healthcare, the nation's largest for-profit hospital chain. Under the agreement, which is standard for entry-level nurses working at HCA hospitals and becoming increasingly standard for other health systems, Rum agreed to pay back the hospital for training if she quit or was fired before her two-year contract expired. Despite the agreement, Rum said she quit after 13 months because of the physical and mental strain, citing staffing that was so thin she was often unable to take even a 30-minute break during her 12-hour shift. As a result of leaving, she has received seven letters since October from a collection agency working for HCA demanding payment for the remaining $2,000 in training costs the hospital says she owes and threatening to charge her interest and legal fees. Rum says, we're being preyed on by someone in power. We're desperate for a job. We just got out of school. We don't know any better. I didn't even take time to take a lunch have time to take a lunch break my hair was falling out the level of stress just wasn't sustainable well rum said she did receive about 10 weeks of training and mentorship it fell short of what she expected given the four thousand dollar value the hospital placed on it some of the in-person classes covered material she'd already gone over nursing school or that wasn't relevant to her specialty and she had limited time to spend shadowing a more experienced nurse the practice of uh, requiring payment for training programs aimed at recent nursing school graduates has become increasingly common in recent years with some hospitals requiring nurses to pay back as much as $15,000 if they quit or are fired before their contract is up. According to more than a dozen nursing contracts reviewed by NBC News and interviews with nurses, educators, hospital administrators, and labor organizers. Hospitals say that repayment requirement is necessary to help them recoup the investment they make in training recent nursing school graduates and to incentivize them to stay and amid a tight labor market. But some nurses say the system has left them feeling trapped in jobs and afraid to speak out about unsafe working conditions for the fear of being fired and having to face thousands of dollars in debt. According to uh, Breen O'Neill, a regulatory policy specialist with the National Nurses United, a labor group with more than 200,000 members, um, she says, these training programs do not provide nurses with any sort of new qualification. Rather, employers are passing on to nurses the cost of basic on-the-job training that's required for any RN position at any hospital. And then they're using the contracts to lock nurses into their jobs or risk this devastating financial penalty. Having that debt hanging over them means that nurses have a harder time advocating for safe conditions for themselves and for their patients. <clears throat> so this is a lot. This is a long story and a lot to go into. But please take a look at that story. Um, again, it was from NBC News. You can check that out. Uh, this is coming out of Illinois. Uh, from nurse.org. And I wanted to share this story because we've been following um, what's happening with Ascension. Uh, so this is interesting. It says Joliet nurses sue Ascension Health System. On February 22nd, 2023, current and former workers in the Chicago suburb brought a federal class action lawsuit against Ascension Health, which owns St. Joseph Medical Center for wage theft. Attorneys and representatives for the Illinois Nurses Association claim that Ascension Health has withheld millions of dollars worth of compensation and wages, paid time off, and other benefits. Nurses and other workers claim that the hospital failed to pay them correctly, including bonus shift incentives and overtime, even before the pandemic. 
They say that they brought up their concerns repeatedly. However, they have not been addressed. Four nurses are named plaintiffs in the complaint. One former, former interventional rate leader is suing for over $2,000 in incentive pay. An additional 726 owed to her was discovered during the investigation of this lawsuit. Current psychiatric nurse Amanda Woolcock alleges in the complaint that she was supposed to receive a raise in July 2022 for her contract. When it didn't show up on her paycheck, she contacted Human Resources. She was told someone would look into it, but her rate never increased. Nurse Jennifer Kachinarzik, and I know I probably butchered that. My apologies, Jennifer, was supposed to receive paid time off from her extended illness uh, bank during recovery from an injury. She claims her PTO was applied incorrectly and she is owed $2,714 and 41 hours of improperly used PTO. Erin Lindy, a former med surge nurse at St. Joseph, was paid inaccurately over several months because, quote, the time cast keeping system was down nationwide. Based on her own records, she believes she should have earned 38.8 hours of PTO, was, but was only compensated for 19.18. The lawsuit alleges systemic compensation problems at Ascension Health. It also suggests that the health system has engaged in, quote, improper cost-cutting measures. So again, this is a story in nursing.org. Uh, We've already talked about Ascension Health. Uh, it's uh, Ascension is a St. Louis-based hospital system, the fourth largest health system in the nation. It boasts 139 hospitals in 14 states. One of them happens to be, of course, Indiana. A nonprofit tax exempt healthcare system. Um, Ascension Health is supposed to benefit the community. Yet a recent article published in the New York Times, which we had previously discussed here on this show how a sprawling hospital chain uh, ignited its own staffing crisis claims the ascension puts profits before patients. In other words, by cutting staff and failing to offer better pay, it essentially caused its staffing shortage. According to the class action suit brought by the nurses in Juliet, Ascension has cut nursing staff by 23% since 2018. However, data published on Ascension Health's website say the number of full-time equivalent nurses at St. Joseph in Juliet has grown from uh, 4.72 in 2018 to 5.02 in 2021. So there's an open investigation. Um, And uh, that's in, into this. A letter was sent by U.S. Senator Tammy uh, Baldwin of Wisconsin and questioned the uh, Ascension CEO Joseph Impeachy about its business practices. Um, she highlights recent investigations in Milwaukee, where Ascension operates 24 hospitals. News journalists there published reports about, quote, disruptions to patient care, long wait times in the ED, delayed surgeries, and staff concerns about patient safety. So Senator Baldwin has questioned why the health system is holding on to 18 billion in cash reserves rather than quote, increasing pay and improving work conditions for its burnt out and un overextended healthcare workers. So we'll be keeping an eye on what's happening with this. But again, I've been sounding the alarm of what's happening um, in this industry. Okay. This is another strange case. Um, and this is bringing up things from COVID, and this is why I'm talking about that, because we're seeing more and more stuff come out. This is from ABC News. Um, L.A. assisted a living facility faces felony charges over deadly COVID-19 outbreak. And here's the interesting thing about this case, um, which I didn't know. Okay, so it says uh, the investigation began following um, the death of a resident. They had admitted a new resident at this facility on March 19, 2020, despite protocols at the time limiting outside visitors, including patients. The facility allegedly failed to test the patient for COVID-19 or quarantine the patient for 14 days prior to admission as required by health protocols, according to prosecutors. The new patient began showing COVID-19 symptoms a day after arrival and tested positive for the virus that evening. 
Ringo was allegedly ordered to admit the new resident who had come, quote, directly to the facility from the airport from a COVID-19 hotspot in New York City. She tested positive for COVID-19 on March 25, 2020, and died on April 20, 2020. We have evidence to support that the protocols were not followed due to financial considerations of accepting this patient from New York. We believe that Silverado put the interest and financial gain and profit over the safety considerations of their patients and employees. So the Silverado Senior Living Management and its three uh, management and its three managers, CEO Lauren Shook, Administrator Jason Russo, and Kimberly. Uh, Buttram, a vice president, had been charged with 13 counts of felony elder endangerment and five counts of violation causing death in com connection with the COVID-19 outbreak. This is so I, we're seeing not only civil litigation, but criminal litigations coming out of this. So this is why I'm sounding this alarm, we need to look at this. And I keep, hate to keep saying that, but we need to keep abreast of what's happening here because nurses, I don't want you to get in trouble either. I don't want our license to be taken for something stupid that a facility is doing and we need to protect ourselves. But more importantly, we also need to protect our patients. And what can we do? So um, again, this is a, a ongoing case. They've been... Um, charged but not nothing has come out you know the full case hasn't run its course so we can't say they were guilty of any of that um but this is why uh the things are happening it says the case was treated as an industrial workplace accident a uh, prosecutor said the investigation led by the california division of occupational safety and health took over two years due to COVID-19 restrictions at the time and due to several um, employees leaving the facilities prosecutor said um, the, char the charges follow a lawsuit against the facility filed late last year by relatives of several residents that were there because they allowed this patient to come in knowing that they had co you know, hadn't done the safety protocols and exposed them to COVID-19 and several other patients died and uh, I believe also a nurse died. And so this is, again, one of those issues. So we're going to keep going because we're running short of time. I'm going to skip that one. Um, I do want to talk about this one. Uh, this came from the Office of Inspector General, and um, I found this interesting. So um, it says, OIG inspectors review payroll records for skilled nursing facility. Um, the OIG recently inspected payroll records from a skilled nursing facility in the greater Houston area to determine if the hours of direct care provided by licensed nursing staff was accurately reported. During the inspection, it was determined that the facility had accurately reported hours worked on 88% of the 514 records under review. However, there was a concern that the facility did not have documented processes for reporting complete and accurate direct care licensed nursing hours to the U.S. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid through the payroll-based journal reporting system. As a result, they over-reported and under-reported some direct care licensing nursing hours and consistently accounted for required meal break deductions. So this is again one of those issues where you have to have the right systems in place so that you can be in compliance uh, with the law and you want to make sure that you're doing your due diligence. I'm bringing this up because these are things that we'll be seeing more and more people um, investigate as they're looking at the number of hours directed to patient care and long-term care versus uh, what's taken up for administrative duties and things like that. Um, so at issue, and this is something that nurses, were, excuse me, uh, and healthcare workers were familiar with, it says, to assist the reporting requirements, the facility uses an electronic timekeeping system that uses fingerprint scans to account for patient hours. By default, this program utilizes a time routing guideline known as the seven minute rule, which rounds staff time to 15 minute increments. So for example, if a staff member clocks in at 7.07 a.m., the program rounds the time down to 7 a.m. If a staff, staff member clocks out at 4.55, the time is rounded up to 5 p.m. Due to an inconsistent application of the seven minute rule, OIG inspectors could not definitively quantify the number of direct care hours 
overreported and underreported within the provided documents. Facility management provided multiple methodologies for how the seven minute rule is applied. Ultimately, all methods resulted in errors. So again, those are things that we have to look at and think about. And I wanted to bring that up for my other long-term care colleagues. So when you're looking at those records, DONs and administrators, make sure you're consistently applying that. That will help you a lot. So just to let you know what's happening. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to just, oh, I do need to talk about this last one. And then we're going to go to uh, our nurse making a difference. But I need to talk about this because this is something I've talked about a lot on the show. Uh, bringing this up with these tragedies that have happened. And unfortunately, another tragedy has happened involving a nursing home and a shooting. This is from McKnight's Long-Term Care. And it says, unlocked door enabled nursing home shooting death. Security experts urge better preparation for such emergencies. And we do a terrible job of protecting our residents and preparing for these emergencies and protecting our staff too. So it says... Um, a partially paralyzed 23-year-old male was shot dead in the room he shared with one other person at Lake Merritt Healthcare Center in Oakland, California. The shooting happened around 1 a.m. Saturday after two men sneaked in through an unlocked door, according to local outlet KTU. An Oakland councilman told reporters that it was, quote, a targeted shooting. Local reports noted that the deceased was shot multiple times and was the son of an alleged San Francisco gang leader who was convicted in federal court on firearm and drug charges. Still, Steve Wilder, president and founder of Sorensen Wilder and Associates, a security and safety consulting firm, told McKnight's long-term care news on Tuesday that while there appeared to be many unanswered questions about the incident, one thing was clear. A perimeter door should not have been left unlocked at that hour. Wilder said, you walk in a fire line, excuse me, you walk a fine line in letting visitors in and not letting visitors in. It was unclear Tuesday what type of security measures or personal personnel are normally in place at the facility. And I can tell you, as a person who worked in long-term care at night, sometimes it's a couple of nurses, if you're lucky, on each one on each unit. On, our, on ours, we had two nurses because it's two units, and maybe two or three aides, if possible. That's it in a large facility where there's a lot of rooms to hide in. There's a lot of... Um, closet. I mean, there's just all these different places that people can hide. And we have to think about this. So security measures at nursing homes, not so much. Um, Wilder said his firm advocates that the facility perform vulnerability assessments and have on-site security. But if there is no former security team, he said, then at least identifying a staff member to check the perimeter doors and secure any that are left open or unlocked is a valuable, valuable step. Nursing homes can implement visitor management policies with regular visiting hours, but Wilder acknowledged it's not always a simple thing to develop them. Still, a defined process for after hours visitors might have been a factor in prevention. KTVU reported comments from other pa uh, patients' relatives indicating that security was lax at Lake Merritt. The facility told the TV station that it is conducting an internal investigation into what happened. Um, staff Stan Siptek a disaster planning expert who works with nursing homes told McKnight's Learn Long Term Care News Tuesday that SNFs should have a plan for handling perimeter, a per, per, perilous, excuse me, situations. Staff also should be aware of any unusual circumstances with residents over staff or visitors. Long term care facilities must be prepared for all types of hazards and perils, including acts of violence. And we've certainly seen that where a ban came in and shot his wife. Um, we've had a resident stabbed by another resident. We reported on that. Um, and personally, um, I was in a facility. Fortunately, I wasn't there that day, but it was reported to me that the family member of one of the residents brought in a butcher knife 
and was intimidated the nurses with it. Uh, we've had staff members or our residents, family bring in guns and other things. So this, this is something that we need to look at. And how are we uh, doing those safety measures So for nursing homes? So I'm bringing that up again because it's important. All right, so then our last segment, because we're going, yeah, we're getting really close to time. This is a, a really long day. I want to get to announcements. But our last segment is this nursing, nurses making a difference. And these nurses and faculty deserve all the accolades. And this is coming from Medscape. And it says, nurses, nursing students, faculty take tackle dual fight, dual in-flight emergencies. All right, make it bigger so I can actually see it. There we go. When faculty and students from the University of San Diego School of Nursing boarded flights to Uganda recently, they looked for they were looking forward to working with patients and providers at the region's oldest children's hospital and getting valuable hands-on experience and global health. But instead, they received a high-stakes lesson 20, 32,000 feet in the air. Rakima Sellers Pompey and Stefan Panoff, both seniors in UCD's Doctor of Nursing Practice program will graduate in May, were together with two colleagues on the second leg of the long flight. They were nodding off to sleep when a flight attendant requested emergency assistance over the intercom. Once the nurses reached the back of the plane, they saw another another flight attendant, one they had just been joking with earlier, lying on the floor. Although he was alert and oriented, the foursome began taking his vitals and gathering information. Um, Sellers Pompey says our DMP program sets us up for taking a good history and a proper assessment. Um, she's an Army nurse who's worked in the emergency department for 14 years. She says the nurses observed that the crew member was tachycardic with slightly elevated blood pressure, and he explained that he had been experiencing vomiting and diarrhea. They quickly determined that severe dehydration was likely the culprit, but mid-flight they were worried about a lack of some medical supplies that might prevent adequate interventions. Um, so they were able to locate um, the emergency kit bag that they had. Um, so they were able to start an IV, give the flight attendant um, to give the flight attendant uh, some IV fluids and some nausea medication. She began to feel better. The nurses monitored her until the paramedics took over in Amsterdam. And it says also on the second leg of her flight, Fuller, uh, Grant Fuller, who is the, the associate professor of nursing that was with them, um, heard a flight attendant ask for medical assistance. An older woman had become non-responsive. So she says, we gave her oxygen and rendered assistance, said Fuller, who was joined by a German physician and a US resident physician and a nurse. She says, I don't have a diagnosis, but a response was likely someone having a seizure or a neurological event. Fuller and the other healthcare professionals stayed with a woman until the plane landed in Amsterdam and paramedics intervened. Uh, so further as it goes on, as the students and faculty met in Mabara and discussed the event, they realized how rare their journeys had been. So this is great. These nurses did a great job in keeping these patients alive or these, um, on a flight until they got there. So those are our nurses making a difference. So congratulations to those nurses. I want to go ahead and move on to our last part of our show, and that's to get to our announcements. So coming up, um, our Nurse Shark Academy will be having the Nurse Shark Academy Finance Freedom Workshop, Financial Freedom Workshop, March the 29th, 3 to 5 p.m. It will be live streamed on LinkedIn, and also on our Facebook Nurse Shark Academy page. So please go there if you want to get to that. Uh, I encourage you to get there. We're going to bust down those myths of uh, not ha not knowing where to start as a nurse to start your business, not having the money to start your business, and that um, other myth of, of um, not having the, the support that you have. So we're going to bust those myths wide open for our show. Also, special offer. I was going to wait to the event, but I thought, nah, I'm going to do it now. 
very special offer um, at the event, but also currently to those that are already watching the Nurse Shark Academy uh, members that you already know because I gave you a sneak preview. Our ebook is out and it's on the website. I'm so excited. It's our kickoff primer for you just to get some great tips on how to launch your business. That is available on the website. You can get that now um, if you want to. And I encourage you to do that before the price goes up. Price is going to go up um, at the end of the week. So get it now before the price goes up on the ebook. But it's available on the nursesharkacademy.biz new product page. Um, so we'll be having some things that will be coming up for products for that as well. I'm so excited um, for that. And so again, I want to thank you for tuning in for our events. We're going to have some other things come up uh, for those of you that are attending our, our event um, on the 29th. Don't you don't want to miss it because that's going to be live stream. It's only going to be up for a short period of time and then I'm taking those videos down. But um, I have a special incentive for those of you who are ready to take action and jump in and start your business. And I want to tell you, if you want to start your nurse owned business, you can do that. And you don't have to have all the pieces in place to get started. And I'm going to tell you how and show you how. So let's do that. Come on the 29th. I'm so excited. I can't wait um, to have that great event. Um, so that's March the 29th from three to five. You can register on our Facebook page, on the Nurse Shark Academy Facebook page, or you can go to our LinkedIn page and you can register there for that event. Uh, we already have... Um, uh, about 45 people register for that event. And then we, so when we get to capacity, we get to capacity for the event. Um, that's how that's going to go. And so I'm excited about this and I want you to get in. So get in when the getting's good and we'll live stream it there. Uh, again, there won't be replays. Hear me now. There will not be replays. So 24 hours, those videos go down. So you want to get to the live event because that's going to be very important. All right, that's all. Have a great rest of your day. And I'm going to encourage you to like, comment, and share our content. Don't forget about our podcast on the Nurse Shark Academy uh, show that is coming out. Our latest episode just went up. Thank you to uh, Dina Leglin um, and uh, giving us some great information. Uh, so her episode is now up. You'll be seeing more promotions about that in the coming weeks. Please join us on the Nurse Shark Academy. You can get us on Podbean and other places where you get your podcasts, including Apple. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great day.